Good afternoon. You've joined us for another episode of Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii, broadcasting from the, from the Think Tech studios in Pioneer Plaza. And Think Tech is, uh, excuse me, Likeable Science is all about how science is a, a fun, vital, and interesting part of everyone's life and should not be relegated to ivory towers, should not be hidden away or feared or dismissed, but should be embraced by, by all. To help me explore this today, I, ha I have two fascinating researchers here. Kinesa Serafin and Joanna Filipoff, and both from the Curriculum Research and Development Group at uh, UH. Kinesa is a director also of the UH Sea Grant uh, 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 Center for Marine Science Exploration, I guess, and Joanna is a program manager uh, of uh, science education. They actually both work together on a number of interesting projects, as well as the one that we're going to talk about Opihi here today. Uh, but they also work on a, a, a very fascinating professional learning uh, uh, process called uh, Teaching Sciences Inquiry, Teaching Aquatic Sciences Inquiry, I guess, <laughs> and, which is a, a sort of an extended professional learning opportunity for, for science teachers to get them to think very critically and, and metacognitively. They developed and, and work on an Exploring Our Fluid Earth curriculum, which is a, a research-based place. It's online now at ourfluidearth.org. Um, so anyone can access that, uh, middle school, high school range. Yeah. And Voice of the Sea, which is a television show, I guess, that uh, really Kinesa uh, runs. And that broadcasts... 6 p.m. Sunday nights on K5. Oh, OK. There we go. Cool. So that, that active people doing lots of good stuff with marine biology, intertidal zones and all. Before we get into our uh, actual dialogue, I, I want to do uh, just uh, my little science campfire story that I do. Uh, this is an odd, odd little thing I ran into some years ago. There's a, a group of animals called tunicates that are actually chordates, although you wouldn't really know it because the adult forms live uh, in a sessile form that is a, a, they are attached to the substrate and, and look more like some sort of plant or sponge. But the larval forms of these are actually quite active. They swim around through the ocean. They have sense organs and motor systems and, of course, a brain to integrate between their sense, uh, sense organs and, and motor output. But what's fascinating is, after swimming around and finding an appropriate spot to settle down, these organisms settle down, and one of the first things they do is they eject their brains. They literally throw away all the nervous system. It's expensive to maintain it, you know? So, and I just, when, when I read that, I, I just thought, I know people like that. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, sorry, just my little sidelight. Um, so, Opihi, tell us about how, how Opihi came into being, or sort of what it is. Well, first I think we'd like to say thank you so much for having us here. And, You're very uh, welcome. I'm very <laughs> delighted to have you guys both. <laughs> We're excited to share. Um, Opihi started as part of our National Science Foundation funded graduate K-12 program, which brought graduate students into classrooms working with K-12 teachers. It was actually funded to help graduate students be better communicators of science. So right. essentially the function of this show and, and bringing science um, to the public and to our K-12 students. And so Opihi was part of that project and actually Joanna was one of the graduate students. So oh. when she was in graduate school at the University of Hawaii, um, one of the original researchers on that project. And now we're here 10 years later um, revisiting it and trying to collect some new data. Cool, very neat. Yeah, it's a, that, the, that GK-12 program was a very good program. I, uh, I had worked at the University of Washington with, with a number of graduate students on that and, and still have vivid memories of some of them coming in to interview for it and just stringing black tape along the white table and dropping a, a little car onto the tape and the car just starts running and running following the tape very neatly. It's like, yeah, the kids are going to love this. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it, it, was, it was really wonderful to, to really engage researchers in helping communicate science better, as you say. Yeah, I think both of us are a project, uh, product of that program, and it certainly affected my trajectory professionally. Mm -hmm. And so it's really exciting to be able to revisit what sort of got me interested in science education. Right. And then, so you, you actually were, you, got, you, you started out as a student in that program, but then you, you ended up managing it, right? Uh, I started out as one of the managers. Oh, so okay. I was uh, not the first uh, original person who okay. came up with the program, but I took it over. Um, after it was around for about five years, and mm -hmm. so I, I took it over in the, the latter part of those oh. years. Okay, well, great. And so uh, tell us a little bit, uh, Opihi are limpets or snails, right, that are 
reasonably common, I guess, around Hawaii, but not so common here on Oahu, right? I think we have a picture of them, too. Oh, okay. Um, there, there we, we go. go. <laughs> okay. okay. So Opihi, this is the Blackfoot Opihi, and um, this is a, a limpet, but it's actually not very common on Oahu. It, um, it's highly collected, over collected, really, and also, um, but it is in the intertitle. And but this program that we're talking about is called Our Project in Hawaii's intertitle right. acronym Opihi. Right. Ironically. We don't see a lot of Opihi in Opihi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that is because we have worked with middle and high school students in the past, and so we choose more bench type areas that are safer and that are accessible. And we've worked on Oahu more in the past. And so we just haven't come across those, but we're still very proud of our clever acronym. <laughs> <laughs> Always got to have a good project. We're also made. looking at more like tidally dominated intertidal areas versus wave dominated. I was going to say the limpets would be on very rocky rock yeah. areas, typically where they're being smashed by waves. Mm, right. Very hard to sort of get a group of 20 kids running around. That. <laughs> exactly. <Dangerous. laughs> okay. Um, so, and you chose the intertidal zone because it's a really critical sort of uh, ecological uh, buffer or uh, meeting place, right? Yeah, so it's uh, the, really the interface between the land and the sea. So you're hitting the impacts of both what's happening on land and as the, at the base of the watershed, as well as impacts from the ocean. And so um, the intertidal is uh, it's covered by water at high tide. Um, we have a picture. and. Then at low tide, it, the surface level decreases, and that range is the intertidal. In Hawaii, it's only about a meter. So in other areas where the intertidal has been much more well studied, it's much larger. Um, but it, it's such a, a critical ecosystem, and it has so many threats that are associated with it. Right, the intertidal sort of gets, in a sense, the worst of both worlds, right? Mm -hmm. Anything bad that happens to the ocean shows up there, and without a lot of depth to buffer it out, and anything bad that happens on land washes down in the first place mm -hmm. it hits is the intertidal, yeah. so, yeah. <coughs> um, but it is, a, it's, an, it's an incredibly valuable sort of nursery zone, too, right? There's lots of organisms spend at least some part of their life often as a youngster in the intertidal zone. If I understand it, I'm not a quantity. <laughs> <laughs> well, often actually. bays and estuaries might be more of a nursery area. I think that intertidal is home to some nursery organisms, but it's also just home to its own suite of um, unique organisms that are adapted. So, um, like on the slide here, you can see there are um, two forms of lemu or algae, and they tend to be flexible, um, like the one in the bottom left-hand corner, to tolerate like the waves moving in and out, or organisms that are camouflaged. So you can see there's actually a fish hiding in the Podina algae above there, um, and then there's like the operculum on the snail, which is the hard covering that prevents it from drying out, um, or the, the clustering of some of the smaller snails. So they're again they're also clumping together to prevent themselves from drying out during those areas when the um, intertidal is actually exposed to sunlight. Right, right. No, it's, it's a very it's a very tough uh, environment to live because you have to be prepared to be soaked and pounded by waves or to be baked in the sun, and, and those are very extreme conditions mm -hmm. and, and demand rather rather different <laughs> things from you. <laughs> I was just reading it, they, they're finally, I guess, some of the uh, material scientists are finally uncovering how the muscles make their adhesive threads to stick to rocks underwater. And it's been a, a real puzzlement before, as, as you know, if you try to glue something to a wet surface, it doesn't work very well. But they've, yeah, uh, the, the muscles nice do it thing, very well. The nice thing about the inner title is that these organisms are uh, hardier than some right. other ecosystems and so uh, you can pick things up for short periods of time and whatnot when you're investigating. Right, so this, this gets into again one of the advantages, right? It's, it's this rich area, it's got all kinds of interesting stuff, it's pretty accessible and you can get kids out there and help them really get mm -hmm. get their hands wet as it were uh, in, in a reasonably safe re safe and, and reasonably um, non-injurious non environment too, right? You teach them a little bit of basic uh, reef etiquette and or intertidal zone etiquette, right? Uh, but that's so it's uh, it's great because kids more and more are not sort of exploring that kind of space on their own. More and more kids are living in more urban areas, uh, not as close to the ocean, not as 
just not getting up to, to sort of wander the beaches like they used to. And so it's important for them to learn this. Right, I think that's actually why the project is funded. So this is a NOAA, a National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration project focused on, uh, it's called Be Wet, so it's Bay Watershed, and it's trying to get teachers and students actually out into those watershed environments. Mm -hmm. um, and as Joanna said, the intertidal at the base of the watershed is really, it's impacted everything that's happening upstream, so all the anthropogenic effects of eutrophication, so nutrients feeding in and, and potentially um, causing disturbances because of um, the nutrients increasing algal growth and thereby um, increasing the spread of invasive species and things like that and just um, disrupting the balance of organisms in that area. Sure, sure. You know, I mean, we just saw with our recent rains, uh, I look out on the alawai yeah. out our back window and just see all this stuff washing into the alawai, all the crud, uh, really sort of frightening how much yeah. stuff ends up there. <coughs> But um, so th this is this is great, and th one of the beauties of it you mentioned earlier is you're, you're sort of spreading your science out to a broader audience. This isn't just sort of science for scientists. It's not science for research per se. It's science to get kids involved and, and a broader community involved, and sort of thus fundamentally citizen science. Yeah. So this is a, a citizen science project, which means that it has both science and educational goals. Mm -hmm. So especially in the inner title, it's exposed for such a short period of time during the spring and summer for such short, a short number of hours that unless you have this cadre of trained citizen science, it's a very difficult ecosystem to monitor. And um, so that's why that's part of the reason why citizen science, it can help scientists collect a lot of data that are like geographically and temporally and spatially disparate. Uh, if you have a lot of people helping you out to collect that data. And then conversely, with the educational goals, you're creating scientific literacy, exposure to the environment, um, hopefully developing an ownership of this area and the watershed that these students are going to, that they can uh, take more of an interest in conservation issues in their backyard. Yeah, ab absolutely. And, and plus, you get them involved in very authentic science. They actually understand what it means to do science, to gather data, to understand that science isn't some staid set of cast in stone facts. It, it's, a, it's an evolving set of knowledge and, and a process of learning. Yeah, so no, it's yeah. And this is an authentic project. The data that the students collected right. in um, 2003 to 2007 resulted in um, a number of scientific publications as well as educational publications. And so they're participating in a project, and when they ask us, what are you going to find? We can actually say, we're not sure. Like, <laughs> no, you, the data that you're right. collecting is so important. Yeah, yeah and that, that's really great. I mean, so, so much science is so badly taught in schools when people just set up experiments where, yes, the outcomes are all known well in advance, and this, they become sort of meaningless. But having them actually involved in going out to a new environment, seeing what's there, counting the actual things that are there, and reporting back. And conversely, I think when um, science is taught is so project-based and open-ended that the, sometimes students, because they're students, they lose a focus. And this project is nice because it, it is open-ended in the sense we don't know what we're going to find, but we have some definite hypotheses, and we have some baseline data from those students that did the work originally. Um, and so there's, there's a, a nice sort of space for the students to work in where they're doing authentic science, but there's still some real parameters and goals set up for them. Right, yeah, it's important to have a, a bit of guidance so you're not wandering around and just sort of randomly picking up stuff and saying, what's this? But, <laughs> that, but they have identifiers and keys to, to key things out, key life forms out, and be able to say this is this form of allergy or that form of allergy, or this is this crustacean or that crustacean. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And there really are also working in groups, so groups within their classrooms and then um, groups within their island and groups across the state. And so that's a nice aspect, too, because they're all connected by the collection of this data and, um, and temporarily in time, so connected to people who studied it previously. Excellent, because then they're getting the, the, the learning sort of so-called soft skills, but they turn out to be very important in how you get, yeah. get around in life, <laughs> work, going to work, collaborate, work and play with others, you know. Yeah. Excellent. So we're going to uh, take a, a deeper look at uh, Opihi when we come back. But right now, we're going to have to take a short break. You're with us here on Lakeable Science. Uh, Kinesis Serafin and Joanna Filipoff uh, from uh, the University of Hawaii's uh, Curriculum Research and Development Group. And we're talking about Project Opihi. We'll be right back. 
Aloha, my name is Howard Wig. I am the host of Code Green on Think Tech Hawaii. Why do I agree to this? Because I get to talk about energy efficiency, which for me is the cleanest, simplest, quickest, most cost-effective means of reducing our use of fossil fuel and hence cleaning up our planet to become a cool green planet once more. That is my passion. Each week I bring guests in who have specialties in the energy efficiency field and we go in depth and they tell us why their field is so great. And that just gives me a whole lot of enjoyment. I look forward to seeing you in the future. Aloha. Okay. Yeah. So she's the hey, first one. So you're back on Likeable Science. Uh, I'm your host, Ethan Allen. Uh, with me today in the Think Tech studios are uh, Joanna Filipoff and Kinesa Serafin, uh, marine researchers. Uh, we've got all kinds of stuff out on the table here now. This is, uh, we're breaking the second segment. We were talking about the, the project Opihi in the first segment, a little bit in general. Now we're going to really dig in and see what this is all about. So what, what is this? <laughs> Uh, these are some of the tools and techniques that we utilize in the field. So before students go out into the field, there are three main activities that they have to do in their classrooms, uh, because we are training citizen science here, mm -hmm. so we want to make sure that they're prepared to go out in the field. So the first thing they do is a sampling activity, and we actually use m and for that. The second thing we do is teach them about sampling with transects and quadrats, so sampling mm -hmm. for abundance. Right. So this is our quadrat. They can be all different sizes. Right. Ours are about a foot, about a, a third of a meter, and they're based on the size of the organisms that you find in the intertidal. Right. So the size of the quadrat varies with the size of the things that are in the environment. Sure. And then we use uh, something called a transect as well. This one has a lot of <laughs> this one has a lot of sand coming out of it. It's authentic. <laughs> uh, it's basically it's basically a, a, a really big ruler, and so um, because we're scientists, we use the metric side here. Um, and then you will lay these and along in the intertidal and actually measure points along the transect, and then all of these points in the quadrat. So this is a, a photo quadrat. It's a way to teach students how to collect data using quadrats and so we generally do the point count and so here you'd see um, a specific species of sea cucumber or um, padina which is a type of algae um, and then you can also do the percent cover as well like you know 30 percent of one species or another species so this helps make for very comparable data so the data that one student mm -hmm. gathers is similar to and, and can be directly linked with data of another student and one group versus another group, yeah. one site versus another site, because everyone's using the same sets of measurements. Yeah. So in our project, we actually train the teachers in a professional development course and go through each of these activities with the teachers in the classroom and then out in the field. We also give them all of the materials that they would need to conduct the work with their students. Excellent, because that's, that's necessary. Teachers often are very busy people and not a lot of time to, to do something as exciting as this, but uh, that would involve a whole lot of extra work preparation. You know. I think so, we have a video of our teachers actually in the workshop looking at. Uh-huh, okay. Let's see if we can get that up. So this is a, a transect. They can be commercially bought like this. We get ours through the forestry supply stores. But they, all, but they don't have to be. So you know, this is a transect. This is sort of called a surveyor's tape here often. They're kind of grouped in the same area in forestry supplies. But this is also a transect, and it's just a rope of known length with intervals marked at reg regularly with, um, this just has some flagging tape. Species richness is the count of something. Abundance is how much area that organism takes up. And abundance is, is really useful when you go out into an environment because different organisms take up different amounts of area. and. What we're looking at right now here is going to look at abundance, but depending on your survey question, you might be more interested in the number for richness. So it really depends on your survey goal, your question about what you want to look at. So 
you know, here for richness, you could look at the richness of and actually count everything in a certain area of the sample, or you could look at what percentage or how much room, how much area something would take up with abundance. However you guys want to lay your transects. <coughs> Sorry. Um, Let's do the white side. We have to go this way? Oh, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What does okay. the yellow side say? Um, okay. It's a meter. Yeah. Hey, you still are. Yeah. 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 it says M, there is yellow. Are we going to just do it up at Oh, you are? Oh, okay. Right, and that's absolutely, you know, that's critical for teachers to see something a lot of them have probably never done before, right? So they've got to see it in a, a, a safe way, a sort of low-risk way first in their classroom with, with other teachers, and they can get a chance also to practice it with their students in a safe way, you know, in a, in a again, a sort of controlled environment and help, you know. So it's, yeah, no, it's wonderful to, to see you walk them through this, the same steps that they then walk the students through so that uh, everyone catches on. This is, this is the, the way this is. It's the way you do this, and this is why you do it, too. Yes. Super. Another really nice aspect is that the technology that they're using is, is fairly low tech for mm -hmm. technology. And so they, I think a lot of times now, you know, we have so much electronics and iPhones and computers that sometimes, or electronic thermometers even, mm -hmm. and students forget or don't realize the importance of, you know, why do I need to learn how to use a ruler practically? And, and this project really combines both high-tech and low-tech uh, um, it, science. It, it, is, it is surprising uh, how few people actually know how to use a ruler. I, I uh, taught adult ed classes with my wife, and you have people measuring things, and they say, oh, an eighth of an inch. Well, <laughs> that's not anywhere near, you know. One of these skills you would think, yes, you would think kids would pick it up in second grade or somewhere, but they don't. So it's great, great to get them out and practice it. You know? uh, excellent, excellent. Um, so what? Uh, let's just jump jump in this and say, well, what did they find? You know? So we've uh, the results of this project were actually the first description of community level patterns at multiple intertidal sites across the Hawaiian Islands. So oh. the student data was the first description of this environment, which was so cool for the students and of course the researchers. Oh. Um, it was really a wonderful experience. <laughs> we also found zonation, uh, which is the banding of different algae at bench sites, which are flat as opposed to only cliff areas where it's a little easier to see this zonation pattern. Mm -hmm. And we also did see patterns in terms of, you know, bench sites versus more rubble type sites, but nothing really um, was significant when we looked at things statistically, which is another reason why we're going back into the field. We realized that the really gross categories that we were clumping things into 10 years ago, we need to collect more water quality data and things like slope, um, and, and look sort of historically about like maybe sewage spills or something like that to see what is actually impacting the watershed and thus what's impacting the intertidal areas. Excellent, yeah. But so you're saying a lot of these sites had really not been sampled in a quantitative sort of way, but were not, not by anyone going out and sort of saying, okay, there's X, right. X amount of Y organism and Z amount of. Yeah. So they collected measures of, for example, like, um, in records of invasive species and percent cover of the invasive species, but we don't have a historical scientific record to go back to to be able to say, well, this is increasing, or to make relationships between areas where there's a lot of nutrient inflow or um, runoff or non-point source runoff, um, for example, areas that people are concerned about because of what's happening to the shoreline. Um, and so the second study that we're going to be able to do now is really going to let us look and say, all right, over time, how have things changed? Uh, okay, so that's, that's going to be great. And you'll, you'll, take, you'll get more of this kind of data about the water quality and the, mm -hmm. the specific uh, pollutants yeah. that may be in the water and, and that kind of stuff. So using the same um, sort of biological protocol that we have set up and then adding in these more physical and chemical factors to our analysis. Um, and having this long-term monitoring set has really um, 
kind of unique still a little bit, and mm -hmm. it's such a privilege to be able to um, sort of add this to what we know about this environment. Yeah, yeah, no, that's incredibly valuable, incredibly valuable. Um, so where, where do you see this leading now, you know? <laughs> That's funny that you have. We actually just received notice that um, we're being recommended for another funding award through the University of Hawaii Sea Grant College program that will provide us with some more rigorous scientific data, which is really exciting. We're going to be working with the University of Hawaii uh, Marine Option Program um, to more intensively study sites, uh, primarily on Oahu, but also a few states statewide and really get some high level scientific data that we can then also compare to our student and teacher data, which is great because we can validate the student and teacher data and make sure that it's, it's scientifically sound and also delve deeper into some of these um, questions about the relationship between um, sea level rise, what's happening with ocean acidification in terms of climate change and also the nutrient inputs that we were talking about. Right, because it does seem that, that things, even here in the middle of the Pacific, are, are changing uh, from historical uh, norms, as it were. I think climate change, especially for the intertidal, is going to be very interesting in the tropics. Uh, you know, the intertidal is, has these historic, you know, they've, they've dealt with the rise and fall of sea level, the right. whole ecosystem, for a very long time. Uh, but it, not all studies, but some studies in California have shown that there's a northern progression of the species. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're on an island. <laughs> they can't really, yeah. you know, migrate that easily. And some of these species, like Opihi, have a very limited larval dispersal range. Hmm. And so we're, those factors are going to come into play as well. So, you know, I think we're at still a critical point of collecting that baseline data to see have things changed in 10 years? And if, you know, are things going to change in another 10 years? And to be able to make some management um, recommendations in terms of like where are sites that are still relatively pristine and we maybe need to protect them or um, what sites are being overly inundated by um, anthropogenic effects and things mm -hmm. like that. We just, yeah, we just don't know. <laughs> right. No, this is, this is the, the beauty of this. You, uh, because you put sort of armies of students out there, you're able to get a lot of this data that then allows you to make evidence-based decisions rather than just sort of by guess or by gosh or I think it goes this way, you can, you can actually say, hey, we have evidence that says this is a good site, this is a stable site, this has been, you know, has a great species diversity, it's relatively undisturbed, it's relatively staying the same, so yes, let's, <laughs> let's not stick a big hotel right beside it and, you know, pave it over. <coughs> um, or vice versa, you know, here's a site that, that is degrading very rapidly, we need to take active steps now to manage it, to protect it, to keep people away from it, or what have you. Yeah. So that, 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 that's absolutely wonderful. Um, so did, uh, how do the, how do the te teachers and students react to this? I mean, because this is very different from them, a lot of them, right? This is, not, this is not their sort of standard, like open your textbook and you know, you know, read chapter two and answer the questions at the end, right? This is, for some of them, has got to be sort of revolutionary, right? Um, I think. So I'm going to speak very generally. So GK through 12, the program was extraordinarily right. well received right. um, nationwide. Right. Um, and in Hawaii, we had a, a pretty very, a very successful longer term uh, iteration of that program. In terms of OPE, um, it was anecdotally really well received, but we actually didn't collect as much assessment data as we perhaps would have liked. We do have evidence of student gains in content and process skills. And we have some data from the teachers about like their use and how they used it in the classrooms and applied it in ways that um, we weren't necessarily anticipating that were really exciting. Mm -hmm. But this time around, we're going to really try to drill down more into like what are the effects on the students and the teachers in terms of their own scientific knowledge, in terms of both content and process. Right, and, and ho hopefully get into some attitudinal issues too, right? Mm -hmm. Are you creating people who have higher levels of interest in science, higher yes. levels of sort of uh, stewardship behaviors that they're exhibiting, that, that kind of thing, yeah. And that, that like I mentioned, the, the program being funded through NOAA BWET is that is one of the major goals of that BWET funding is to empower teachers and students with the knowledge to um, affect change in their local environment and also to just care about it. and take ownership. Right, and again, the, this uh, issue of, of more and more young people being less and less engaged with the natural environment is a really critical one. And we have to, 
There, I mean, there are big national movements now, you know, uh, get kids out, outside and, and expose them to natural environments and help because they won't, if they don't interact with them, they won't really learn to appreciate them and love them and respect them and value them, basically. And I think the same is happening even in science research where we're, we're have this technological revolution where we're able to, you know, visit the deep sea and, and do all this remote sensing, which is critical for our understanding. And yet it also means that, you know, scientists may no longer even need to go to sea. You, you send your instrumentation and, and you sit at home and, and control it by computer. And so I think there needs to be that fundamental human environment connection in order to um, make those, that research meaningful. Absolutely. And I, I think we'll, we'll go, go into that a little more deeply here in, in the third segment of the show. Right now we're, we're uh, finishing our second segment. We're going to have to take a little break. Uh, you're on Likeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen, uh, Kinesa Serafin, and Joanna Filipoff from the University of Hawaii, Sea Grant, and uh, uh, CRDG. We'll be right back. Aloha. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. My name is Josh Green. I'm the host of a program called Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm a physician. I work in the emergency department on the Big Island. I also serve in the state senate, which please don't hold that against me, doesn't detract from my television program. We speak about all the big health care issues in the state. We get together on Tuesdays from 2 o'clock till 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And we try to talk about the most important issues in health care. This is a terrific venue for people to learn about health care. There are many programs on this on this station. We broadcast it later, uh, not just on the internet, but also on OC16. Thanks for joining us. Please be informed healthcare consumers. And you're back here on Likeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen, here on Think Tech Hawaii. With me today in the Think Tech studios are Joanna Filipoff and Kanisa Serafin. We're talking about Project Opihi, which is exploring the intertidal zone and getting uh, students, teachers and students involved in gathering authentic scientific data about who lives and what lives in the intertidal zone, how much of it's there. They had done this some years ago, got some great baseline data, and now they're going to be starting up another program and going back to uh, see how things have changed here in over a span of about, I guess, 10 years. I think we wanted to start this off with a, a video, right? You have a, another video on, on uh, the algae? Yeah, great. We have some teachers actually in one of our professional. This is just a snippet of the algae that we're going to see. So beginning to appreciate algal diversity. This algal has, has manifest your pizza. You don't see it every time it branches. Mm -hmm. So, did you guys ID this one? Well, we made this key. There's actually really great keys in this book, too. Um, well, so let's, I'm going to yeah. Okay, so, so this is a not a calcified algae. It's a brown algae, so yeah, it'll, it's it's more close. Yeah, that's a red. So brown algaes are all going to be more closely related so to each other. This is sar sargassum. Mm -hmm. Okay. There is. This is a draft. It is not making bubbles in vinegar. Really hard to identify. <laughs> Joanna has some. Credit. Yeah. So I. Uh, so the algae we use uh, these ID cards, and so these are the most common um, algae that we find in the inner title. Okay. And the uh, data sheets also have the algae on them as well. But we also um, bring in presses, so you can check your ID as a compared to presses. And actually, the students can create their own books okay. for their own ID books. So this is the actual algae. Dried and flat. Yeah, okay. this is um, this is actually a, a Gracilaria species. That's um, Ogo. So this is a edible algae that's in our uh, poke and not very common huh. <laughs> because this is one of our overharvested species. Oh, <laughs> so that's another threat that the intertidal faces is that it is accessible, and so the species that unfortunately the ones you know we like and tend to want to conserve are also the ones that. As humans, we want to remove from the inner title because <laughs> we like them. <laughs> we like to eat them right. or have them as pets or, or what have you. Right. Yeah. You know, it's 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 an environment that, that faces a lot of different threats. So, uh, so are there ways to to get the same citizen science groups into very active conservation? Can they restock algae? 
There are some native limu restoration efforts. Right. There's a couple on Oahu that I know about, and I'm sure there are some on the other islands, and we're hoping to perhaps partner with them in some way, or at least share what we're finding about where there may be more or less native species, and, mm -hmm. and we, they can help us hypothesize as to why. So, I mean, how do you go about sort of restocking algae? <laughs> Oh, I'm not actually <laughs> sure. <laughs> I think they, they, I think it involves some sort of tying these these little pieces of algae onto settlement plates. Yeah, oh, and okay. and just sort of fingers crossed a little bit. <laughs> um, they do the same, like so. Um, a lot of the the fish ponds, oh, they want the limu in there. So the limu not only for the fish to eat, but also for them to harvest. So they'll do like multiple species harvest, and that's. Similarly, so that's where a lot of the limu restoration is work is going to, and specifically targeting those edible species. Sure. Maybe we want to talk a little bit more about the ID cards too, Joanna, and one of the things uh, about citizen science and being sure that they can identify species in their area. Uh, sure. So there's ID cards. These are actually mostly for Oahu, and we're hoping to develop them for the other islands as well, and that's actually one of the products that we're hoping to come out of this grant is these more site-specific ID cards. One of the things that we did to make sure that uh, students could ID species, as Kinesa kind of referred to earlier, is we actually had, in 2007, scientists and students collect the same data along the same transect, two sets of researchers and a students. It was a bit of a nightmare <laughs> to coordinate. <laughs> Uh, but then we actually looked at the variance between the researchers and saw where students fell in there. And students are collecting very similar data compared to researchers on, at sites with more than 60 species that they're wow. IDing. Wow. And some of those are to genus, like mm -hmm. just a, a more of a broader group than to species, mm -hmm. but it's pretty amazing. Yeah, I, I guess in all and a lot of citizen science projects, it's that whole issue is, is the data that the citizens are gathering, uh, is that right. going to be comparable mm -hmm. to the data the scientists would gather? And again, this is, speaks to your need for setting up a clean, clear process, training the teachers very well to, here's what we do, here's why we do it, here's how we do it. And knowing the limitations of the data that you expect those students and teachers to collect. So like Joanna said, sometimes we're looking for the students to um, mark categories or um, genus, a, a genera, rather than down to the individual species so that we don't get misidentifications. Right. Because what we really don't want the students to do is to um, mark something um, falsely because they want to label it. So it's important that they say, I, like, I don't know what this is, if they don't know what it is, right. um, rather than to label it as something different just so they can put down an answer. <laughs> Yeah, actually, we have a little bit of information on MISID, so students are, have a tendency to um, oversee invasive species, I think because we stress them, and we're like, uh -huh. oh, it's really important that you see these, and we want to track their spread, and so uh -huh. instead of actually recognizing a native, they're like, oh, this, we're really excited we found <laughs> this invasive. Uh -huh. And so that's a good reminder to us as facilitators and teachers to, you know, all the the identification of all species right, is right. really important. You have to let the data do the driving. Right? You can't decide in advance what the data is going to be. That's a, that's a very dangerous kind of trend to get into, right? But a really important scientific lesson to learn. Right, absolutely. absolutely. We, 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 we will find what we expect to find. And if you set up expectations in the kids' minds that are going to see these invasive species, they're going to see them, right? Mm -hmm. Whether they're or not. <laughs> Uh, and that's one of the, like, taking the photo quadrets, too, is uh, important. So we have some documentation of, of what was actually there that we can go back and ground to. That's, that's, that's <laughs> great. Um, so we have, I think, one more video that we, you wanted to show here, right? Oh, yeah. So now that's for a somewhat different program, actually, right? But Well, they're connected. So the video that you're going to watch is uh, just a 30-second public service announcement about our Exploring Our Fluid Earth curriculum. And the really great thing about the curriculum is that it is online, and so it's freely accessible. Um, and so it has these OPE lessons, or as we update the lessons, they will go into this online curriculum. Uh, but it also has a teacher online community. So teachers across the state, as they're working on our project, can upload specific lesson plans or activities um, that they've done in their classrooms and, and share resources and ideas and ask each other questions. Excellent. Sounds very exciting. Sounds very exciting. <coughs> if that video is ready.
Exploring Our Fluid Earth is the dynamic curriculum developed by the University of Hawaii's Curriculum Research and Development Group. The award-winning Fluid Earth and Living Ocean textbooks are now interactive and online. New activities, updated content, and a teacher community. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is now freely available. Find out more at exploringourfluidearth.org. This curriculum is actually online right now. We're currently in the process of updating content, so please uh, keep visiting. We have <laughs> lots of new changes in the next year. But we do ask uh, if you're a teacher to just sign in so we can um, offer you additional materials such as this teacher community that Kenisa was talking about where you can share resources in terms of uploading PowerPoints and other student assessment type items. Yeah, that would be really critical for teachers <coughs> who may get, for whatever reason, not quite have the same access as some other teacher. They can, they can grab data from one site and compare it to their own. Yeah, and, and yeah. So can... the curriculum is actually going to have a to-be-made <laughs> database for mm -hmm. the new version of the OPE. Because one of the things that, unfortunately, we weren't able to do 10 years ago because technology wasn't really there <laughs> is that we would literally collect the data sheets after the students took the data, they might do something little in their classroom, but then we really analyze the data. And so with technology right now, we're hoping that the students actually input the data to the database themselves and then can actually see what other students are collecting across the state and we will give the teachers tools to develop their own comparisons and the students can ask their own research questions uh, among sites. Oh, that's great because then they could, yeah, they could look at different sites, they could look at temporal trends, mm -hmm. they could follow a given species and see where it's uh, appearing and what, it's, what one species is doing, whether it's increasing or decreasing at a given site, yeah. All kinds of interesting ways if they're, uh, and have them be part of that process uh, gives them ownership on, the, on that knowledge then. Absolutely, and one of the really amazing things is, you know, students, they often think outside the box that we as adults or even trained scientists sort of compartmentalize ourselves into, and so it's really exciting going into this project and. I'm sure that there will be many students who think of things and ask questions that we haven't thought of, and hopefully we'll be able to work with them to address some of those issues. Yeah, well, that's, that's a nice thing. If you get rich databases, you can begin to extract information that you wouldn't have even thought was in there. I was, uh, had a guest on recently who specializes in that and has, goes into military health databases and, and gets all kinds of information that can suggest the sort of the mental well-being and depressive state of veterans. Uh, even though the data was not set up to do this initially, but so it, it, is, it is very powerful as you get a lot of, you get this sort of big data together now. So that, that's, that's wonderful that you're really, it's very cutting edge. <laughs> uh, so I, I guess then, um, what kind of, uh, how do you want to engage more teachers in this? Is there some place they ought to go? Do they just contact you? Uh, yeah, so we're going to have our application coming out in the next couple of months. But in the meantime, if you could uh, email me at uh, philippo, P-H-I-L-I-P-P-O, -I -I -P -P at hawaii.edu. Okay. Um, I can put you on our list to get our application. Okay. Our, then we're going to recruit in the fall, and our workshops start in the spring. So there are two-day workshops. There's some online components as well. and. Teachers get supplies, they get professional development credits, a small stipend, um, school bus money. <laughs> school bus. Oh, that's critical. We, we, yeah. That, that, that's yeah. A big, that's so a we're, big issue. Uh, we're really excited to offer this, and we're, going, we're looking um, at doing this professional development not only on Oahu, but as on Kauai, Maui, and the Big Island as well. So we're looking wow. at about eight teachers per island. Wow. So there's a great opportunity then for teachers who really want to get out of the classroom, get their kids out, <laughs> out into the real world and, and contribute to science action in an active way and help their students understand what science is really fundamentally all about. Uh, that sounds super. Uh, so I, I hope uh, teachers will uh, look at that and uh, get in touch with you. I suspect they could probably do it through the Exploring Our Fluid Earth yes. Uh, yes. website. Excellent. Well, th this has been uh, tremendously exciting to, to learn about this program, to, and it sounds like you guys are, are off and running for, for round two in a big way, and that's, that's going to be uh, uh, super. <laughs> I look forward to hearing it. Maybe I'll get you back on here to, to we can get a progress report at some point. <laughs> that would be great. So thank you so much for coming by. Thank you for having us. Joanna, Kanisa. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, likeable Science, that's another episode, and we'll hope you'll see us uh, next week. <laughs>